In this video, we'll be looking at the formation of new species, reproductive isolation, as well as evolution in present times. Now, as I've said in every video before this one, your exam guidelines are extremely important because they give you specific definitions and certain um, recipes of what to study to understand the work and to get proper marks. So biological species concept, the definition for that is similar organisms that are capable of interbreeding to produce fertile offspring. You can get similar organisms that interbreed, but they do not produce fertile offspring. They produce infertile offspring. The example I used in the previous video was a horse and a donkey that produce a mule and the mule is infertile. Then we are going to look at speciation and extinction and the effect of each on biodiversity. We're going to look at speciation through geographic isolation. And then we are going to have um, a look at some examples of this, looking at the Galapagos finches, the tortoises, and then boababs in Africa and Madagascar. We're just going to talk about proteas in South Africa and Australia, and then you can have any other mammal on different land masses as an example there. So just before we do go on, let's just quickly look at this recipe of speciation through geographic isolation because then it'll just be a bit easier when we go on to it later on. So if a population of a single species becomes separated by a geographical barrier, so something that hinders the two or separates the two, so a sea, river, mountain or a lake, something that is very big and very hard to cross, um, the population will then split into two. So there is no gene flow between these two populations, which means they cannot interbreed. Since each population is then exposed to different environmental conditions, the selection pressures may be different. Now remember, selection pressures include uh, food, it includes water, it includes the availability of potential mates, shelter, uh, predators in the area may also play a role with that. Uh, diseases can play a role, uh, all as selection pressures. So natural selection will then occur independently in each of these two populations. So as the population is now split because of the geographic barrier, uh, natural selection will occur in this one and natural selection will occur in this population. But they, the selection pressures here are much different than the ones here. Here they might have a lack of food and water, and over here there might be severe predation, so predators trying to catch them. So these individuals of the two populations become very different from each other, genotypically and phenotypically, so they will start to look different as well as their genetics will be completely different. And then even if these two populations eventually meet up again at some point, they cannot interbreed because they have become so different from each other genotypically and phenotypically um, that they are now two different species. So let's move on and then we'll have a look at that again. So speciation, what is speciation? This is a definition. So it's the process of evolution where a new species is formed. And what is the effect of this on biodiversity? It increases it because there are now new species that increase the range. Then extinction, it is the dying out of a species. What will it do to biodiversity? It decreases it because there are now losses that occur and it will decrease the range. Looking at geographic isolation again, so we looked at this in a previous video as well. So we've got a snail population, then we've got a geographic barrier that occurs. So these, uh, well, this population then splits into two. And in each of these populations, they will then have different selection pressures that will cause changes to, or not changes, but the, the fittest um, or the most adapted to that specific change will be the ones that survive and they then pass on these traits and eventually, eventually they become genotypically and phenotypically different. You can see they don't look the same. So when they do eventually meet again 
at some point they are not able to interbreed because they are so different. And then as you know, we need to know some examples of this. So the first one is the Galapagos finches. You only have to know one of these, but be prepared uh, to answer any questions asked. So the Galapagos finches, also known as the Dar uh, Darwin's finches, obviously they occur in the Galapagos Islands. And when Darwin visited the islands, he actually caught a few finches. And when he investigated these finches, he realized that they were very similar to a finch found on the mainland South America, which is not far away from the Galapagos Islands. So what they thought was that this finch from, um, from mainland South America got carried to these islands some way, either uh, by strong winds or on driftwood or something, but they ended up on these islands. And on all of these islands, there are different food sources and different selection pressures, basically. Now, over time, these finches became phenotypically and genotypically different from each other because the distance between the islands were just a bit too far for them to be able to interbreed. So on these islands and looking at the, uh, on the right here, you'll see that there were different food sources. So on the one island, they had seeds. On the other island, uh, there were some cacti and then there were uh, nice little vegetation pieces, not the proper word, but there was vegetation to be eaten. And then on the others, uh, on the other islands, there was some insects. Now, how these birds became so phenotypically and genotypically different is because the birds on the one island that had the seeds, the birds that survived were the ones that had a bigger beak shape that were able to crush these seeds. And they were the, the ones that were able to find more food, so they were more likely to survive and pass on this trait to their offspring. Whereas the birds with the, um, the cacti were able to eat the fruits and the nectar from the flowers because they had very thin beaks. And they were the ones that were able to survive and pass that trait on. And similar with the other finches. So eventually, these birds became so genotypically and phenotypically unique that they won't be able to interbreed with each other anymore. Then, describe the process of speciation through a geographical barrier. This was actually a question asked in the 2019 final paper, paper two. And this is the memo for that specific question asked here. So you can see that the the marking guidelines are very similar to the exam guidelines provided to you and the recipe that you need to use. So a population of a particular species became separated by a geographical barrier. There was no gene flow between the separated populations. So natural selection occurred independently in each population due to different environmental pressures or selection pressures and the populations became different from each other, genotypically and phenotypically. Even if the populations were to mix again, they can't interbreed and they are now new species. So straightforward answer, just like it was in your exam guidelines. And if we just go up, this was a question asked from a recent test, uh, a 2020 test. So speciation is an evolutionary process where new species are formed from the original population. Then they've given you a diagram with species A, species B, and then we see that there's a geographic isolation, which is a valley. This is an essay question. So now they ask, using the diagram above, describe how new species were formed from the original population of salamanders in California, and then also describe the reproductive isolation mechanisms that could prevent the organisms from interbreeding. Now, reproductive isolation mechanisms we'll look at right after this. So, once again, if we just look at the, the marking guidelines for this, the formation of the new species in salamanders. So, if we compare these two answers, you'll see that they are very similar. They might just use the actual organism, which is the salamander, but the original population of salamanders became separated by the central valley. So in this case, 
where they have given you the geographical barrier that has popped up and caused um, separation of the two species, you can name it uh, because they've given it to you. So you can actually name the central valley and you'll see that these two answers are exactly the same. And then when we are done with reproductive isolation mechanisms, you can just come and look at the memo here. So just pause the video when we are done uh, with explaining it and then you can just come and have a look and you'll see that it is pretty similar as well. Another example of geographic isolation also on the Galapagos Islands is the Galapagos tortoises. So Galapagos actually means tortoise. Now there are quite a few islands uh, specifically on Pinta, Hood Island and then Isabella the biggest one. There are quite a few different tortoises. So on Pinta Island we have the intermediate shell tortoise. On Isabella there's the dome shape and on Hood Island, there's the Saddleback. Now, if you look at these tortoises pretty quickly, you'll, you won't really notice a difference. But looking at the Saddleback tortoise, the, the shell actually goes up um, like a saddle, like, like you would get when riding a horse. And you can see it here. So why do they have this? It allows them to extend their necks because the food on Hood Island is from small bushes and trees. So these tortoises need to be able to reach uh, the leaves from these small plants. Whereas on Isabella Island, the vegetation is on the ground, like on the right hand side here. So they can just eat the grass without having to lift uh, their heads up. So with them, their shell actually comes over their head for protection. And then on Pinta Island, there's an intermediate shell uh, because there's a variation um, of leaves of small bushes and enough grass for them to eat. So that's another example. And once again, these tortoises also became separated at some point, And then they had to adapt to the different environmental pressures. In this case, it was the food and then eventually they become phenotypically and genotypically different from each other. In case you don't know what a boobab looks like, this is a boobab from South Africa, Southern Africa. I think this was actually taken in the Kruger National Park. I'm speaking under correction. And these are the boobabs found in Madagascar. Just to give you a size uh, comparison, those are humans walking there at the bottom. So that's another example of geographic isolation, how the two species became separated at some point and they became genotypically and phenotypically different from each other. Then let's look at reproductive isolation. Now I find this quite interesting because there's animal behavior involved, which is really interesting. So what do we need to know? We need to know that there are certain reproductive isolation method, uh, mechanisms to help keep species separate so that there is no interbreeding of different species with each other because some of them can interbreed like a donkey and a horse, for example. So what do we need to know under this? We need to know that breeding at different times of the year occurs. You get species-specific courtship behavior. Then we get adaptation to different pollinators, so this is in plants, we get infertile offspring, and then we get prevention of fertilization. So this is just to prevent populations from extend, uh, exchanging genetic material, all of these points here at the top. So let's look at breeding at different times of the year. So different animals mate and reproduce at different times of the year. When one breeds, for example, from January to March and the other one from March to May, they will never be able to crossbreed uh, because of these different breeding times. An example of this is the Rana frogs. So they are related frogs and they have got different breeding times. So the one breeds from January to March and the other one from March to May. So if they, were to ab if they were to breed at the same time of the year, they would be able to interbreed. But
but because of this breeding at different times of the year, that does not occur. Then the skunks, the eastern spotted skunk and the western spotted skunk are also able to interbreed. That's why they have different breeding times. So the eastern spotted skunk breeds late winter and then the western spotted skunk breeds late summer to try and avoid that. Then species specific courtship behavior. This is also known as behavioral isolation. So courtship behavior between males and female indicates sexual matur maturity and will eventually lead to reproduction and fertilization. So if courtship is unsuccessful, then mating won't take place. So only organisms of the same species will respond to that specific species specific courtship rituals. That means a leopard won't be attracted to a lion's uh, species specific courtship rituals as an example. Now I've tried giving you as many examples as possible in the space that was provided. So as you can see there's quite a few animals involved here and some of them have some very elaborate colors such as the, the peacock spider which I'll show you a video of in, in just a second. And then the birds obviously all very colorful. Uh, you get lizards that have these specifically the males have these very f colorful flaps of skin that they will stand at a, at a high position so that they are visible and expose the, the skin to attract females. Birds have flying displays of swooping, cartwheels, diving and even dances. They display col colorful feathers. Um, this is specifically of males. Then you've got, I think this is called the death spiral that you'll find in the bald eagle in America. You've got calls of certain certain mammals have mating calls you know lions roar to advertise their territory and advertise where they are to the females and the females will then also call and respond to the males so mating calls roaring croaking humming singing croaking in frogs um, humming and singing in birds you will get and then mating dances by insects as well and then they also have pheromone secretion so scented chemicals in animals or color changes that signal sexual maturity such as in the ostrich so male ostrich when they are ready to mate their shins will become this uh, pinkish color to signal to the females that they are ready and then this is not part of the syllabus but I find it really interesting um, animals have special organs uh, situated at the top of their mouth in their palate region and in snakes here you can see it's called the, the Jacobson's organ. So I don't know if you've ever seen um, animals or specifically, well females will do it as well, but males when a female animal is urinating they go lick some of the urine and then you get male lines pulling a face like that and we call it the Fleming grimace. So basically they're using that organ to try and pick up if the females are receptive for mating or if they are an estrus. So that's quite interesting. Let me quickly show you this video of the peacock spider displaying its colors to attract females. They've got very elaborate dances. Look at those colors and then a lot of booty shaking. You can go look at these videos yourself as well. As you can see on the right hand side there's quite quite a lot of videos that you can look at. Then uh, the, the death spiral of the bald eagle. It's happened that they've actually plummeted to their death with their talons locked like that. They weren't, they weren't able to unlock before they reached the ground. Sometimes they do it very last minute. But I mean look at how impressive that is. Then a bird of paradise. Birds have got some elaborate dances with very colorful feathers as well.
there we go so just so you get a bit of a, a better idea then adaptation of plants to different pollinators so this you kind of did in grade 11 we looked at a lot of this as well so the structure color and scent of flowers uh, that will attract birds so wind pollinated or bird pollinated and if we look at these flowers at the bottom so this one is bird pollinated and you can see that the flower of uh, this plant is specifically adapted for the long beak of this bird you won't really get other animals that will be pollinating this flower so it's species specific then you've got the wind pollinated flower that is has a large surface area to expose its um, its itself to the wind so that the pollen can get carried by the wind and then also uh, so that it can be caught if there's pollen that lands on it then you've got certain orchids use food deception or sexual deception to attract pollinators this orchid, uh, orchid for example looks quite like that of a bee so a part of this orchid looks like a bee to attract other bees so insect pollinated flowers release pheromones to attract specific pollinators structures so insect pollinated flowers are shaped to match the mouth parts of specific pollinator species like this uh, one down here floral structures imitate male uh, sorry female organs of female pollinators to attract males and then the stamens release pollen when triggered by body weight of specific pollinators which is quite cool as well then prevention of fertilization so you'll have incompatible sex organs either the shape size and location of the genitals will differ within species uh, so that you don't get interbreeding happening an example of this is damselflies so this is all of the different male reproductive structures that you get in the da different damselflies so that there is no interbreeding that can take place then chemicals are released that stimulate the gametes of same species but inhibit the uh, fusion with foreign gametes so even if mating did take place um, it will inhibit the fusion of the gametes because of certain chemicals that will be released so the chemical structure of gametes ensure that sperm can only penetrate the egg of the same species but lacks the specific protein to fertilize the egg of another species nature is just so amazing infertile offspring so if it does happen like we've spoken about if two different species do mate and they form a hybrid it will be sterile so it will be infertile uh, this on the left here is a liger so a cross between a liger and a tiger then you have the mule so a cross between a, a donkey and a horse and on the right here is a unique one it's called a zonkey and it's a cross between a zebra and a donkey now this should not have happened because of uh, the chromosomes being so different so this is quite a rare occurrence and there was quite a lot of studies done on this specific uh, zonkey I think it's in a zoo in Italy it was a male zebra that jumped his fence and got uh, lucky with, with a female donkey and we move on over to evolution in present times and here you just need to know one example of natural selection and ev evolution in present times so the options that they've given us is use of insects insecticides and the consequent resistance to insecticides in insects um, then development of resistant strains of tuberculosis causing bacteria and then HIV resistance to antiretroviral medication and then the bull beak um, so the beak size and body size of the Galapagos finches now with the insecticides the specific insecticides that they are speaking about here is uh, DDT so they did use that quite extensively um, in South Africa at some point and there was quite a lot of environmental 
issues with regards to that. They stopped using it and then the mosquito population just boomed again. There was an increase in malaria cases. So then they started using DDT again. Now, with all of these, you'll see that I keep talking about the recipe. So the answer, how you answer it would be the same. You will just replace, um, obviously, the subject matter. So you will talk about HIV resistance or antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And let's move down and then we'll look at what I'm talking about. So this was a question um, in, law, in 2019's final paper, so paper 2, specifically question 2.5.6. So you can go have a look at that question. Uh, but it was about uh, bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics. So this recipe you will use throughout. So there was variation, very important to mention that. As you see, you get a mark for that. There was variation in the pop, uh, population of the E. coli bacteria. Some were resistant to antibiotic A, so they were sp speaking about specific antibiotics, and others were not resistant. Those bacteria which were not resistant to antibiotic A were killed, but those who were resistant to antibiotic A survived, and they were able to reproduce, passing on the alleles for resistance to their offspring and over time, the resistance to antibiotic A increased and the percentage of the bacteria dying decreased. So you can see that this is very similar um, to the natural selection recipe that you should answer. Um, please don't talk about the, uh, the antibiotic becoming resistant to the bacteria. That's not how it work, uh, works. I remember a lot of a lot of students writing that down when we were marking the papers. Then mosquitoes and the DDT resistance. So once again, you can use this at the top and just replace it with mosquitoes and DDT. So once again, there was variation within the mosquito population where some mosquitoes were less resistant to DDT and others more resistant. When using the DDT, the less resistant mosquitoes are immediately killed and the more resistant mosquitoes survive, these resistant mosquitoes reproduce, and the whole population consists of resistant mosquitoes in subsequent generations. So can you see it's very similar if you're going to have to talk about all of the other uh, topics here. The Galapagos finches, you can just go look at um, geographic isolation because of the food, so, um, the food that was available for these finches. But that is, that is the end of the third part of evolution. Mm -hmm.